Welcome to season three, episode four of The Open Educator, the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. We are back and we have a supreme guest today who's going to share his journey and wisdom. First, I would like to say thank you for taking your first step to grow personally and professionally today. And I would encourage everyone who has a camera to turn it on and listen with intention. The USF Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program develops students in three main ways. One, we help students build businesses. And if you walk anywhere in the Tampa Bay region, I'm confident you will find an alumni who started either a coffee shop, pizza place, Amazon store, tech company they've sold, bar, restaurant, the list goes on, and you have visited many of them. We also develop students to become innovators and entrepreneurial within a firm. And I have more than 15 to 20 students who work for companies you may have heard of, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, you name it. And they're all managing products and services, pushing them to the market, and even developing new complementary products. Lastly, we develop students to define careers they define themselves, not what others define for them. Like many of the other programs. And I have many students who are influencers, but some have gone on to go from social media influencing to now as a spokesperson for brands. We don't know much about these new models of businesses, but we empower students to do, create their own journey and what's possible. And our next guest is an example of someone doing just that. His work is known around the world. I always enjoy talking to him and have known him for years. And I love talking to him specifically about the intersection of creativity and business, which normally doesn't get attention or normally seen as very separate and very different skill sets or not related at all. He has paved his own path, left a trail of breadcrumbs for others to follow, use many of the same concepts that we discuss in and out of our classes and in and out every week on The Open Educator. He's an educator, entrepreneur, innovator, creative in so many ways throughout his life. And our next guest is here to share his journey and wisdom. Please give a warm welcome to creator of Jenny LeClue, Joe Russ. Joe, Thank we you. give a big round of applause while we have our mics on, but in sign language, sure. it's, it's this, waving yeah. our hands like this. So welcome, hello, Joe. Hello. Thank you for, for joining us on Tuesday morning. Where does this cast find you? And can you bring us up to speed on what you've been working on? Uh, I'm not too far from you all. I'm in Sarasota, Florida, so like an hour's drive south. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk with you. Um, and I was going to share, right, just a little bit of kind of my background before we, we talked a little more. Um, can I just share the screen? Because uh, then it's easier, I guess. Can you see that? My keynote yes. window? Yes. Yeah, so my name is Joe Russ. I'm an artist and entrepreneur. Um, who am I? Uh, basically, uh, I've spent my whole life as an illustrator, uh, artist, and now I'm a writer, game designer, marketer, and business dude uh, because I'm an indie game developer. Um, I own my own company, MoGraphy, which I've run for almost 20 years now. Um, mostly had been doing motion design for agencies and commercials and now we're doing uh we're doing video games uh and as per my silly uh portrait i like tiny things cookies and our puppy um so my professional background uh my experience before uh as part of running my own business but before making games myself um is i worked in New York for about 10 years as a freelance creative director and motion designer. 
So I worked on uh, ad campaigns and installation projects and international uh, television network programming. Um, and uh, that was where I kind of uh, got all my kind of professional training and learned a lot about uh, working with clients and working with individuals, but also working on kind of big global brands and expectations of people working at big corporations. Um, you know, but I did uh, some examples there, like I've done work for Samsung and Target and uh, Discovery Networks. And uh, one of my favorites was in Times Square. We did that animated billboard for uh, when Mary Poppins the musical first debuted on Broadway. They wanted a giant thing by the TKTS booth to get people to buy tickets who were cruising around. And of course, uh, at one point I turned 30 and I wanted to teach. I wanted to try my hand in that. So we moved to Florida where I uh, taught motion design at Ringling College. I did that for a year. Uh, they didn't want to pay me <laughs> a reasonable salary. So I figured if I'm not going to be making any money, I might as well do one of my dream projects right now. So I quit that job and I took a leap into the unknown, which is where I made our first kind of big game, which is Jenny LeClue. Detective Who, and it's a, uh, uh, for people who don't play games, it's a sort of narrative game. Uh, it's a sort of detective mystery, a little bit inspired by like a Nancy Drew kind of stories um, or like Veronica Mars or something. Um, and uh, I have the trailer. I guess we're not gonna be able to hear the sound, but we will be able to see the video, we think. <laughs> um, so I can just play sort of this is the release trailer for the nintendo switch oh wait i think i have to switch screens maybe hold on wait for it uh, can y'all see nope hold on where did that video go sorry it's because it's in full screen isn't it all right Oh my gosh. Microsoft Teams. Uh, can you see the, that screen? Yes, we see it. Okay. All right. Sheesh. All right. So this is the release trailer when we released the game on the Nintendo Switch, which is uh, their kind of most recent console platform. Um, yeah, so we just this is just a montage of some of the kind of gameplay. In the game, it's a very text-heavy or dialogue-heavy adventure, but there's a whole bunch of different environments. And as kind of our team is just two people, our core team, and we work with other contractors. But basically, uh, Ben, who's my partner, did most of the programming. I did most of the art, and then we shared all the other kind of responsibilities. So we did the animation and the writing and the game design. Um, and you get sort of a rough idea there of uh, what the game might look like. We wanted it to feel like an animated TV show, like a kind of interactive story you could play, if that makes sense. Uh, I assume you didn't hear the sound for that, right? <laughs> um, no, great commentary but, though. But you could at least sort of see it, so. Uh, all right. So yeah, so uh, an overview of Jenny LeClue is that um, Again, I didn't have funding for that initially, and I wanted to do a proof of concept. So we did a Kickstarter for Jenny LeClue. Um, and then we spent, after that was successful, we spent almost over five years developing the game on a shoestring budget, touring the country, showing the game at different um, events and shows. Um, we eventually partnered with Apple as one of their Apple Arcade launch titles, which launched, I believe, September 2019. So the game is now just two years old. And as of this time, uh, that number is out of date. We've now sold, I think, almost 700,000 copies of the game. Uh, so we are on our way to a million, which is kind of incredible. And now we are working on Jenny LeClue 2, as well as other titles um, as we kind of expand our catalog. So I just wanted to give a brief timeline because this is like not something that, that you know, came out fully formed or happened right away. So you can see, uh, 2005, I think I was still in college and I, I was uh, doing uh, animation, uh, was my major motion design and broadcast uh, animation. So I had this first idea, 
Virginia Clue inspired by kind of crime procedurals and old time radio mysteries that I used to listen to a lot. Um, 2011, I was working at a studio in New York who was thinking about doing internal projects. So I came up with an image and a concept pitch. Um, eventually, uh, they loved that this idea and they wanted to make it, but they were too scared about committing money to it. Um, so, of course, I, I took that leap on trying to raise money for the game or see if there was interest for it by creating a concept trailer and a, a crowdfunding project in fall of 2014. Uh, and after that was successful, Ben and I fell into this black hole of time uh, for like over five years where we kind of built the game from scratch. And then 2019, we released the game. 2020 released on Nintendo's Switch console. We added full voice acting. And yeah, as of this time, we again, we've now, I think, almost 700,000 units. So uh, just briefly, that's a, a little hint overview of kind of the project and and a little bit about me. Um, Can I, I chime right right in right yeah. in to just frame some things for for the students? We one of the concepts or cases that we talk about in terms of this iterative process, and as we can see from your your um, timeline, is this is a long incubation, many iterations, many yeah. going back to the drawing board, extending. We we use a case. Of um, and we talk about Dyson, and the when we were in our scalability class, which is an extension of our creativity and innovation class that does a deeper dive on innovation. So the Dyson family or Dyson um, owner, he had to iterate 500 times to get the vacuum that we all have now. And while I don't know, you maybe you've done more than 500 times from what I see, but we can see that this is not a one and done thing. It doesn't come overnight. It's a constant iteration. And would you say that there was different times where, you know, it becomes more apparent you had to go back to this iterative process? Is there something that, like some, some lesson that yeah. can be drawn from what you've just shared? Yeah, I mean, game development itself is an iterative process, just, just like you're talking about. And um, generally well established that the idea is that, you know, like a lot of creative or business projects that it's, uh, we think of it like a loop, which is, we come up with an idea, we try to build sort of a minimum viable product or something, we test that thing, we evaluate that thing, and then we come back to the beginning of the loop and then we try to refine that process. So so game, game development is a lot like other creative and business processes. Um, and usually it comes down to budget and time is how many times you get to go through that loop. So we didn't have money and, you know, I definitely believe in this sort of uh, fast, cheaper, good pick two, so we didn't have any money, so we did, uh, you know, tried to make it good, and it was going to be slow, but it was also going to be cheap. So, so for us, we had a lot of time to iterate through those loops, and we did, you know, revisit and we changed things. We got rid of things. I mean, there's almost a third of the game that we cut by the end because uh, we didn't feel like it was helping kind of the flow of the story and what we wanted to do, and that was stuff we had already made a bunch of, and that was part of our creative process that iterative. Uh, process, or as we call, like going through that loop. So, uh, definitely applies to that same kind of situation. To highlight a few other things, one, you know, Joe's talking about he had to bootstrap his his uh, organization or his idea. He had to go out and crowdfund, which is a, one of many approaches to to fund a, your your passion project, your businesses, etc. The other idea is this: what he talks about iterative process or but I'd say, you know, he first pitched the idea. First of all, we talk about pitching all the time. This is why video and your videos are so important that you're creating in your in our classes is because regardless if you're pitching an idea per se, which some of you are, depending what class you're in with me, you have to get good at that. And many times in the near future, well, you know, pr predominantly be through video, through virtual, through these technologies that we're utilizing, and you have to be able to execute that. But also... These are forms of learning. And when we talk about the scalability class, we constantly talk about that scalability is constantly learning, knowing what the market wants, right? Joe mentioned he pitched his first idea internally. They didn't want to take the risk. So he had to figure out different avenues to make this happen. Later on, he said, we had to cut out some of the project. Uh, I don't know if this was because of just that the it wasn't helping the narrative, but maybe there was already some sort of feel that 
the, the audience or the market was already liking what was going on and that there was some positive uh, feedback from that. And then maybe we don't need to overextend what we already are, are doing and we're meeting the needs of, of, of the market. So these are all examples from Joe's, what he just shared, how it relates to a lot of the things that we're talking about. Back to you, Joe. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I would certainly say a big thing for us was doing the crowdfunding campaign, again, as a sort of litmus test, or that was a kind of public pitch, right? Is uh, at the time weren't kind of established in the industry. And so now we have a lot more connections. And it's a lot easier to um, to make connections and, and like some of our, our uh, future projects, we're talking to investors and other game publishers about supporting the project so that we, if we don't want to, don't have to necessarily do crowdfunding. But this was a case where it was like, yeah, we're gonna use the public as kind of a guide and see if we can make uh, a concept pitch to them and appeal to them for, you know, everyone's pocket change, which, you know, if you get enough people is enough to kind of bootstrap your project. So that is what we did as part of our process. And now we are, you know, part of the, uh, the process of negotiating with Apple was pitching our game to them as well as showing uh you know that we have uh that we're not just creative but that we're also able to deliver on our promises on schedule on budget and um that's helped us going forward be able to have better connections with uh businesses and other investors so we're still probably will do crowdfunding but that's more about kind of raising awareness as part of our our kind of social media marketing rather than just just to bootstrap the funding. Wonderful. So we found out that Jenny LeClue came out about your vision of a 2005. It's gone through many iterations. How did you get over this idea? A lot of my students and many, I think it's very common to get over that hurdle of fear and rejection. You know, you put yourself out there a few times in just that, that timeline. How did you get over that? Because that's always a big hurdle and one of the biggest questions that come out with people who are trying to push whatever, create a project or business or just idea forward. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, the, the more you uh, the more you put out there and the more you get rejected, I guess, the easier it becomes, I would say, if you're if you're, uh, you know, uh, putting your best foot forward and um, you know, and I like to try to evaluate after a project is done, whether it's been successful on its own terms or not. And then, uh, yeah, I think for me, it's just making making a lot of work and uh, putting out putting out a lot of things. So it's, uh, yeah, I think rejection is just part of the process. I don't know. I don't have any great, great advice for that other than like, you know, keep going and like regroup because I've definitely had tons of stuff you know, that's never lots of ideas and lots of projects that have never come to fruition or been rejected or, uh, you know, uh, we had Apple interested in another another game and we spent almost six months talking to them about it. And then at the last minute, they basically decided they didn't want to sign on the dotted line, even though they really loved the project. So, you know, that was a ton of time and work and energy. Um, and and it seemed like they even wanted to do it, but it was kind of a, some kind of higher level executive decision, you know, who wasn't involved at all until the end. Um, and, you know, it's just par for the course. I mean, for me, it's just about being a train that's like always moving, kind of knowing what you want to do. And then, you know, we reevaluate when we have failures and decide where we want to go next. But yeah, I mean, that's a tough one. It's different for everybody, right? Maybe I can ask to stop on sharing because I want to get down to the nitty gritty um, and relate to some of the concepts that we're talking. And right now, if if we can unshare, are you able to unshare the that screen? Because then I can get oh, to sure. see you and 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 we can have more nuanced discussion. Wonderful. Sure, sure. Thank you. So my students start to explore a bit more of their creativity through our book this uh, creative thinking book that's broken down into a few different pillars. And we talk about the creative environment being very important. And you are clearly a creative person and a creative genius in many ways, 
but let's pretend you're not, okay? okay. <laughs> what, what does your creative environment look like and, and how does it influence your ability to be creative or innovative or, or to execute on your promises as, as you mentioned? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I don't have anything fancy. I just work out of a spare bedroom in our house. So um, my creative environment is like a kid's bedroom. Um, uh, and, you know, for me, the big part of the creative environment is creating a consistent, uh, stable s space that I can do regular and consistent work. Um, uh, and I think about a big part of the creative environment for me is creating, uh, a, that space and that time and that ability to focus, um, regularly, uh, you know, thinking about, uh, I, t you know, some people talk about having like uh, writer's block and uh, creative block and all of these things. And I'm, and I think a lot of that is that whatever kind of work you do, uh, you're not, it's not a, it's not a thing that like comes down magically from the heavens. I believe in putting in the work. So for me, it's like the more time and focused space you have to do work, the more likely you are to do great work. Um, so if I can create a routine and almost like, um, uh, almost like a ritual, a daily ritual for work. Uh, I don't have a better way to say it, but it makes it easier and easier to get into that flow. And it makes it easier and easier to do the work that's important to me or to whoever is doing that. And it increases the chance that I make something good. Like, like Stephen King is a writer who uh, just writes constantly and he writes every day. And it may only be for uh, an hour or two a day, but he he has a really strong schedule and he writes consistently. And I remember I was inspired by uh, Jenny, uh, Jerry Seinfeld, sorry, uh, who at one point started doing, uh, he had a calendar thing and he started uh, telling himself to write jokes every single day. And he would put a big, big red X on the day after he wrote, even if it was just for 15 minutes. And his, he made a calendar that was like, don't break the chain. And so he tried to see how long he could go writing every single day. And you know, whatever you, whether you think he's super funny or not, he's very successful at what he does. And I think a lot of that is he's putting in the work and creating a consistent uh, output. And for me, that's a big part of my creative work environment is I have a simple setup, uh, but it's easy to be there. It's easy to focus there. And I have tried to have consistent kind of schedule in that space that creates more focused time. And we're trying to move towards even more thoughtful uh, work and creative environment. Uh, so I already do like uh, Pomodoro's timer style work blocks where I work 55 minutes and take a five minute break. And the idea is that those are 55 focused minutes where I'm not doing anything but the work that's important. And then I have five minutes to just totally fuck about, uh, walk around, get a drink, uh, chat with somebody or whatever, whatever, you know, check, check my social media, whatever that thing is, but that I'm not doing any of that during that other time. And now we're, we're also trying to work towards a four day work week. Um, where we uh, shorten our our days because again we're uh, self starters, so you know we're not getting paid by the hour. We're not getting paid the longer we sit at our desk. So we just need to get our work done. And so part of that, our creative environment is to try to reduce the actual time sitting there and become more efficient at our work. I have a better way to say that, but more thoughtful in our work, and then have more time away from working so that our creative environment when we're working is even more meaningful uh, for us because we're like not coming back burnt out and drained. Like when we were working on Jenny LeClue, there were times where we definitely worked six and seven day uh, weeks for, I don't know, six, six or seven months. And it's like, we wanna you know establish a better creative process here. So if we're doing a sprint and we need to do that, we're coming in more fresh. And so we're trying to also further balance kind of our, I don't like saying work-life balance because I think that's kind of a, a nonsense thing but uh, uh like our creative uh our ability to do focus work i think and ha come back fresh to that so for me a creative workspace is again whatever works for you um like if you looked at my desk it is uh cluttered with trinkets and uh sticky notes and stuff and i think for some people like my wife that would drive her crazy she would not be able to focus but i kind of thrive in the the trash of my desk so like for me, that's a, that's a great space to be and focus on my work, but you know, it's individual for everyone, but I'm definitely big on the ritual aspects of a creative environment of creating that routine in that space. That's 
easier and easier to get into and faster to get into so that you can create a habit of doing whatever that work is that you want to do. Joe, I'm, we, that was a great visual. I'm trying to envision you working in this trashful desk. I don't know if there's a used <laughs> I mean, it gum, kind of, old food, uh, some ashtrays, yeah. who knows what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, Sometimes it literally is like a trash pile, but uh, I don't know. I just come comforted in my nest of junk, but uh, uh, I, and I like yeah. that too. Maybe, maybe it's like it helps me focus since my work is on the screen or in my sketchbook that like, I'm just trying to like put on blinders and tune out everything else. So the work is like the relief from that. I don't know. Well, one thing that I want to highlight is we talk about the four pillars of creative thinking in my class, the creative person, the creative environment, the creative process, creative products and services. And what Joe has just highlighted is it's important to have for him th this creative space and make it um, so he can focus. But then he talked about several different processes of his creative process that he uses. And he's suggesting it's not lightning strike. It is hard work. He's grinding it, and he's using these different methods to focus and produce more output, uh, better quality of output for the shorter pound of time that he's actually sitting at the desk. So there, this is a, a call to action that says it's not about you have gifts or don't gifts. Of course, some are uh, gifted in certain ways than others, but it's about the hard work that helps you produce that work. So, but that goes for creative projects. That goes for your homework. That goes for interviews that you're preparing for or anything, to any type of project that you're working on. I'd like to take another step back because we seem to put it like a, uh, we, we hide it behind the, maybe your junk pile on your desk. But the reality is, you know, you went to art school, you've gone and taught artists and creatives. And, you know, that certainly that's what you've been built as your expertise. However, You've also built this successful business and you didn't go to business school. Maybe you went to a state school and you had to take something. I don't know. But these are two different, at least in our society, we, we, we educate individuals two different or in different ways and in two different institutions. How did you get up to speed in terms of the business side of the projects? And maybe you can share some lessons because this is the from what i know the fortitude of you looking forward to know what you need to do now or in the past to be successful in the future and these are wonderful stories that joe joe can you share a bit about how you built your business acumen up uh, sure. from the beginning sure i mean i had a i had a healthy influence because my mom growing up um used to be a teacher but later in life she was a a children's book illustrator. And so she, I saw her kind of working independently, setting her own schedule and doing that all well, uh, raising three kids. My dad ran his family uh, printing business. And so we would spend a lot of time on the weekends at the, at the, like in the printing press, helping him do stuff. So we saw a lot of the kind of uh, actual reality of what work looked like young, not just knowing our parents leave for the day and come back later, we see them or whatever. Um, so I already had that kind of early start. I do wish in art school that there was more, I know you've been trying to build that at Ringling as well, but uh, like more of the business uh, aspects of that, because like I was going majoring uh, in something that was about doing commercial art. So I was already curious, like, well, how am I? And you know, you all probably have bigger student loan debt than I, but I was coming out of school with like, almost 40 grand in student loan debt. And I'm like, I don't have a job. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have a place to live. Like how, like, how am I going to get started in this when I'm not some established uh, genius artist? And, you know, so I was already curious about that. And I managed to find a job through a job fair at the school, which I definitely went to because I was like stressed out. Like, how am I going to pay all this debt off? And I went to a business, uh, to a company in Austin, Texas. And it was uh, this guy, Ron Pippen who had worked for an agency, a huge agency in Austin for almost 20 years and was finally starting his own business. And it appealed a lot to me because I've always been interested in kind of the entrepreneurial aspects of that. And it was just him and like his best friend who worked at like a car dealership who was like gonna be the producer and he was gonna do all the creative direction stuff and bring clients on. And so for me, that was exciting because I got to learn with them. It was a less intense environment than going straight to like LA or New York, working in a, a big agency or a studio with like 40 people or something. 
And what was really great for me is they literally, they had opened maybe a year before, but I just always was really hungry and curious about what I wasn't good at or what I didn't know at all. I mean, I was, you know, like 22, so I wasn't good at everything, at most things. But, uh, you know, like I literally would ask them if I could sit in on their business meetings, on client calls, um, if I could go with them to pitches, which are things that I, you know, I was just hired to be an animator and a graphic designer. So in a bigger company, no, you know, you wouldn't even have the opportunity to do that or ask. But they were like, oh, this guy's interested and excited about this. Of course, you can come with us. You know, don't say anything stupid. Don't fuck this up for us. But, you know, and for me, that was part of being hungry and interested in that. And just seeing, you know, this guy has 20 years experience doing this, uh, you know, at a professional level. See how, A, just he interacts with people, how he does pitches, how they win business. And, like, you know, I'm sure they, they had some flaws in their process. But, you know, coming out of school where I didn't have any proper kind of business uh, education opportunities from art school. That was really informative for me. And then, um, you know, I just always stayed that way. So I, I moved to New York and I was freelancing at different boutique studios doing motion design. So those are like smaller studios that do the work for creative agencies. So they'll like win a big, you know, billion dollar campaign. And then they have a whole bunch of different studios, you know, create this ad campaign or this commercial because they don't necessarily have those capacities in-house and a lot of the best talent is at these smaller studios. So I went and worked for a guy who, who used to do a lot of type design stuff at a big company and I was not good at that. So I really tried to like lean on him to learn that and follow his business practices. And again, ask to come with him to any pitches and meetings, even if I like wasn't on that project, if, if there was time and availability or if clients like came into the office, I would either try to be in on that meeting to listen and take notes or I would literally just eavesdrop from my desk if I could like overhear them from like the client room so for me like a big part of that was just being even now is just being really humble and and uh you know try to be a sponge and and learn from people with more experience even if some of that is negative things like whoa I don't want to have client interactions like this like you know I worked with a producer and they were super way too like accommodating to a client who would just make last minute changes and want all these things that would require so much labor. And so, you know, when I got to do creative directing, instead of just being an animator, I would come in and be like, hey, that's really, you know, to the client, I'd be like, hey, that's really exciting. Uh, let's like think about a, a solution because it sounds like you have a problem here, but we don't quite know what the solution is for that yet, instead of just saying yes to everything. So I, I just try to absorb uh, from everyone around me with more experience or different experience and learn from those things both positively and negatively. Um, but just being curious about that, because I would see a lot of people were happy to kind of just stay in their lane um, and just do their one thing. And I'm like, some of those people are amazingly talented at what they do, but a lot of my friends and colleagues are artists. And so they're really afraid of the business aspect. So I had worked with people who were more talented or more seasoned than I but I definitely was making more money than them because I was not afraid to negotiate. I wasn't afraid to like, even if I was like nervous and fearful of a negotiation or asking for what seemed like a ton of money, it's going, hey, I can sit down and I can rationalize what is the value I'm adding? Uh, what is the business? What is like, I mean, if they want me to keep working for them, I must be making them money or they're not going to ask me back. And they're not going to pay me this. So like what value am I providing? What's that worth? And how do I negotiate that with them? So, you know, I had friends who were definitely much better, faster artists than I who were making like half of what I was making in a day because they just were afraid of that and they hadn't been hungry about kind of learning those things or getting in those things. And I know you all are learning this business stuff, so you're already in that. But even then, it's like, yeah, trying to be a sponge and be open to learn from people. Even if you don't like those people, there's definitely people I've worked with who I do not like at all. But I was like, oh, there's so much to learn from them and, and how they run their business or like how they interact with clients uh, and all of that. And, and for me, that's just a big part of, you know, never thinking I'm I'm the biggest fish in, in the pond or that I know everything. Uh, you know, what's what's the saying is just always be kind of the dumbest one in the room. I think I think that's a good one uh, as long as you're trying to absorb all of that knowledge. Or just listening. Yeah, listening. I you learn a, a lot I have more a card by listening. On my desk here. Yeah, sorry. I literally have a card on my desk that says "Stop talking." Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can see it, but uh, yeah, 
I definitely have that problem of talking too much when I need to be listening. So that's a good one. I'd, I'd like to prime our students after I ask Joe a couple more questions or, you know, what questions do you guys have? I know you guys are hungry. All my students or many of my students have their side hustles going. Some have their own businesses. Some are doing freelance. Some are going to Fiverr. Some are have their own Amazon uh, warehouse. Some have their own business a franchise, pizza franchise, a shoe uh, fading business. Uh, the list goes on and on. And then maybe even social media, of course, animation and, and other things. But um, how did what soft skills did you think helped you grow your business the most? Because we yeah. in business school we talk about technical. I assume animation and motion design is, is largely technical, but there's all these other soft skills that we have as humans. I mean, they're also humanistic skills. What soft skills do you yeah. think have helped you? Um, I definitely think, uh, yeah, being able to work with people is, is such an undervalued thing and can both be really easy or really hard. Uh, when I'm looking to hire people, I would, uh, hundred times out of a hundred, I would hire the person who is less talented or less fast, but is easier to work with, more reliable and like has a good attitude. And it's like, because when you're just, when you're like in the shit together, like you don't have time to deal with egos and uh, you know, whatever it is you're doing. And I think uh, a big thing for me is a lot of my work is like, I was again, not the most talented there, not the fastest at what I was doing, but I was reliable. I was like, open to feedback, I like work with clients and communicate well, and also communicate when something was like unrealistic. If someone was like, can you do this thing in two hours? And I'd be like, no, that, we can't do that. Like maybe I can do something in a, like a full day or whatever. Um, but I think, yeah, I think that's one of those kind of just uh, seems really simple and obvious, but there's lots of people where it's like every other person you work with is like, a hot shot and it's like oh i'm not working with you again because your work is great but like that only works for you alone it doesn't work in a group so if you're ever working with other people i think uh, the biggest soft skill is just being able to like get along with people have good verbal written communication skills like it's not it's not exciting sounding but just those kind of and you know just and just being reasonable as a person to work with I know actually that's a lot harder than sometimes we think it is. I know the students can't stand group work. And that's partly because I th we all have this experience. Working with people is not necessarily easy. But yeah. it's a lot of what Joe is mentioning, putting yourself out there, listening, being empathetic, trying to understand if it's the client or any type of student in your group and realizing there's probably some sort of middle path, but everyone has to be willing to put the effort forth to make that a common ground, a common collaboration, yeah. some sort of common and shared language. Uh, and that's why in my a few of my classes, you have to create a personal charter or a group charter, which Joe, I'm sure you guys are familiar with, like a form of a project management tool. So what are the rules of engagement that we all have? Because if people have different expectations or not following through what they're, they promised, how do we deal with that? How do we get over that? Because these are different mechanisms because working with people can be difficult. Yeah. And that's definitely where I always work with new people, almost always from a recommendation and then almost 100% of the time on a trial basis where we try, we dip our toes in the water together. Because for me, I'm like, if I see your work, I'm going to know instantly if like you're going to be a good fit in that way or not. But we need to actually work together to figure out if we can you know, it's it's like being in a relationship. It's like if we can't be roommates, like we can't work together because some of what we do is going to get stressful, even though at the end of the day, we are not, you know, brain surgeons or rocket scientists. But like that stuff can get stressful and you want people who make you feel supported and that you all can kind of do these things together and not that you're like fighting each other the whole time. So, yeah, a big thing for me is always when hiring new people is just work on something small together to see how the communication and the the creative process works and whether that person is like reasonable or not or that like we're a good fit uh i mean you know it's like dating it's like are we a good <laughs> profile match and like do we get along can we laugh about the hard stuff and then you know focus on on the good stuff so uh yeah yeah i think that's a bit i think that's just a big one um and i definitely always also like the idea of when you're you know working in teams is uh 
you know, definitely giving people praise and credit where due and, and not making it about you when possible. Um, unless it's like the bad things and then it, it's, you know, off putting that from anyone in, individually unless they really fucked up. Uh, but then you just fire them. So I guess it doesn't matter. Well, it's not so easy to fire students from groups, but we're yes, instituting yes. that. So you don't, you don't get to pick and choose. So it's obviously more difficult, but that's where, again, I, I just think a lot, of, a lot in life is like, hey, if somebody sucks in a group project is like, what can you take away from that is like, rather than just complaining is like, use them as a, a lesson or a signpost because there's lots of positive influence out there, but there's lots of, lots of bad, you know, bad people too that it's like, yeah, so what can you learn from what they're doing? It's like, oh, wow, I don't want to be the person who's always, you know, uh, nagging everyone, or I don't want to be the person who like says they're going to do something, promises something, and then doesn't deliver. Like, so either I just never promise anything, or I, you know, under promise over deliver. Like, I think, you know, besides just being annoyed, because I totally understand group projects where you don't get to pick that team, which, you know, when I've worked with clients, I don't, I've not gotten to pick any of those people I work with. So it's just working with what you got, right? I'd like to prime the students if they have questions. So just have that in mind. Wonderful. We have a question hand raised. I can't see everyone who, Chad, please. Oh. I was um, uh, wondering, do you have some advice for beginners who are trying to uh, crowdfund? Well, um, that's a great question. Um, like crowdfunding, like lots of other things on the internet, uh, seems to change every day. So, um, it's, yeah, I mean, I definitely think it's one where I would say something we learned from doing the Ginny Clue campaign is to definitely... Uh, <laughs> promise less stuff or promise more vaguely because people will take you at face value and not understand that you're not selling, even if you are selling a product, that you're not like a established retail merchandising thing. And that this is like, you guys are trying to help fund a creative project that hasn't happened yet so that it might happen, but people don't see it that way. So, I mean, now if I, if I did another project now, we just did grassroots marketing um, on mostly on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, but if we did it now, I mean, I would probably be also paying um, a marketer to help us get the word out because it's kind of even harder now to spread the word and maybe some specific influencers who might be a good fit for that. Um, but a big one is we've also grown a really big mailing list and mailing lists sound ancient, but uh, for us at least and everything I've seen, they're the like number one kind of uh, return on investment that if people are subscribing to and reading your mailing list that they are genuinely invested in your stuff. Um, you know, uh, not like a random Amazon buy this purse thing, but uh, like a genuine you're offering them some valuable content for free um, and they want to keep reading that. So uh, yeah, so a big one would be start all your kind of social media marketing early if you can and then, uh, you know, build the best kind of uh, curb appeal to your product because generally you're appealing to consumers, whatever, whatever the service or product is. Um, and yeah, I would build those kind of channels six to 12 months before you're going to launch a crowdfunding campaign. So you're not launching the, the darkness and then don't be afraid to basically uh, annoy every single person, you know, to help spread the word before, during, and kind of after that. Is that okay. sort of, sort of helpful? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Okay. Lauren. Hi. Um, my question was sort of related, but more on the lines of animation. For animation students and artists like myself, how would you recommend we get our like foot in the industry because lots of us are making our thesis films right now and applying to as many internships as we can but if we don't find an internship or a job directly out of college what would your advice be for us to still jumpstart our careers yeah um it's like you'll have both this sort of terrible time to be in and great opportunity uh, I guess partially it depends, like what kind of specific animation or art career you're trying to get into. Like, what is your like dream job? Uh, I'm a 3D animator. I work okay. with 
rigs and stuff, but I also do 2D illustrations and 2D animation, so. So what would be like your top three kind of job opportunities if you got out of school um, and they were like, here they are? Character animator for uh, 3D films and then okay. 2D assets for smaller things. Got it. Just so like, so that's a pretty... Yeah, so like working on like a Hollywood film at like Disney, DreamWorks, uh, Pixar, that's a lot of people have that that goal and that's uh, only so many seats for that. So if it were me, I would probably say uh, move to LA if you can afford it or that area because then all the opportunity is there. And you would see also there's a ton of uh, like ancillary tertiary work that is a foot in that door. So I would try to get into those places. I would expect not to because Everybody wants to work at those places and only a few people out of school are doing that. And then a lot of other people are coming in through the side doors as well. And then I would try to get a job in that same, uh, again, like, like I've worked at motion design studios, pay super well, lots of people doing 3D character animation, rigging, uh, lighting, texturing stuff. And there's way more work. Advertising is never going to go away, even in the worst of times, right? So it's like, I would, I would move to the place where all those job opportunities are and then find work at smaller places first. And then A, you'll make connections there and also you'll literally be there. So if you haven't, you know, keep looking for work at Pixar and they, you know, they're looking to hire people and they're like, can you come out this afternoon? You're already there, uh, which is very specific advice for you. But the other thing I'd say is if it were me, I'm very much self-starter. I would also be doing freelance illustration stuff myself and I would look on any of the kind of job sites relevant for that. I don't know if the school has a job site that has good creative kind of options, but there are lots of things on the internet as well. But I, I also like, I think my first freelance thing I did for like a mega church, uh, my first freelance animation. And it was amazing because that's not, that's not my jam, but uh, they had <laughs> a lot of money and no one uh, kind of with the skills to do what they wanted. So it was a great opportunity to uh, practice my professional uh, kind of remote freelance and uh, pay pay down my student debt and learn while I was looking for the better opportunities. So, you know, I think it'd be like, what can you get that can help you kind of climb that mountain? But assume that realistically, you're probably not going to get to the top of the mountain from step one. Uh, and so it's like, how can you place yourself to have more opportunities to get there or to work your way up to that, if that's what you want to do. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah. What other questions might you have for Joe? Karim. Yeah, hey, so I was kind of the same on, on the same field as uh, Lauren, so I'm a 3D student animator and so I was. I wanted to ask. So, what kind of advice would you kind of give yourself, like back when you were in college, that would have helped you like so much further now that you're here and you're already like um, doing a lot of the uh, work in the field? Interesting. Yeah, advice to myself as a student. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I was pretty happy with uh, my time as a student because it was a great place to really like do creative practice without the expectation of. Um, you know, it just let me develop myself artistically and make connections with other like-minded people who are my age. So um, what would I do differently? I mean, maybe I would have tried to start freelancing while I was in school. I think I probably would have had a, a breakdown but because uh, I was already overwhelmed with like my workload. Um, but maybe I would have tried to like start trying to dip my toes in sort of uh, some paid work. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think for y'all, uh, definitely 100%, because, uh, you know, I went to school uh, almost 20 years ago now, but uh, definitely if you're not already doing your whole brand thing of whatever your work is, that you should be establishing that, whether it's like a separate thing from your personal social medias or not, but, you know, having a portfolio, having posting uh, interesting stuff on your Instagram or Twitter, or whatever, whatever is your go-to platform. I definitely have friends now who are established artists and illustrators and animators and get most of their interesting paid work through like people see their stuff on Instagram and contact them who are legitimate businesses, not just random people who want free work. 
Um, so, you know, I definitely think establishing and developing that stuff so you already have your own thing and kind of not waiting for a job to come along or something, I think is helpful, but it's hard to say other than that, what I would do differently is just, yeah, establishing kind of uh, my own kind of personal brand stuff uh, early. If I was in school now, that, I mean, Facebook like appeared while I was in school. So this is all ancient history by comparison. Was that helpful at all? I don't know. No, no, absolutely. Thank you. Cool. I think that also relates to any type of student, regardless if they're in animation or the arts, you still have a brand, you still have to build a network, you still have to yeah. accentuate what skills you had, you have to be Ill Ill interesting, you have to be relevant. You know, there's many ways to uh, get connected and find jobs. And it's not just through whatever portal through the university or through yeah. some industry, whatever. It's by making yourself unique and valuable to people. And so I think this is relevant to all students um, yeah. to a certain extent. Yeah. And I would say, uh, I guess the other thing with that is, um, I, this is what I should have done is uh, finding people you look up to. And it's so much easier with the internet now and reaching out to find mentors. Um, Cause everyone I know uh, loves uh, helping other people and supporting people, especially those coming after them. Uh, all, all the people I know are, are not jerks and want to help people out. So it's like, if you see someone on, you know, your Twitter, Instagram, and, and they're not some billion follower person who's like just a, a brand machine now or whatever, it's like reaching out to those people and seeing if you can make a genuine connection because they can provide genuine insight into whatever it is you're interested in, but also they might help you make connections. I mean, after my first... I think after my first job freelancing in New York, every single job I got after that was strictly on uh, recommendation or knowing someone who I'd already worked with and was like, oh, this guy's great to work with. Like uh, like Steve is saying, sort of showing my value. And then I didn't even have to do anything to get those other work opportunities. Like I, I did a demo reel out of school. I did a second one when I moved to New York and then I never made another one again because I was working so much and people were saying, hey, Joe, are you available? Like we're, I'm, at my friend's studio, they're doing this crazy new installation thing for a huge event. Like, what are you doing? And I'm like, yeah, I don't even have to look for that job. So I definitely think that's where connections are uh, important. And, and you know, even with the internet, I think it actually does make it easier, you know, as long as you're reaching out to people reasonably, not being stalkerish if people don't like respond to you or engage with you. But, you know, if you can find a mentor in, semi related to what you're doing or strongly related to what you're doing like do that they can be so valuable the right person can just give you that knowledge that you might not have if you're not already kind of working in that industry but also maybe open up doors for you to say like oh i have a friend who's looking for a 3d rigger you should totally talk to them see if that's a good fit it's interesting that you bring that up one of the recent assignments i probably had about 15 different messages from my students the assignment was to identify someone who's creative in their life and to reach out to them. And many students came back, well, I don't know this person. I don't know this person. We can start yeah. seeing why this is built into the programming that I have, because it is valuable. It's putting yourself out there, trying to find this genuine, pick people's brains, take them out for virtual coffee, whatever the case may be. Yeah. These are the things you need to do now to set yourself up for success later. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And you just never know those like loose connections. You never know who's going to actually be super helpful. And so you have to genuinely be invested in people, not just like I'm using you. I hope you give me a job or something. But like you never know. I've had so many people that uh, I've just colleagues with or helped out on something random when they had a like a question. And then later they're like, oh, oh, you're looking for an investor for your game. Uh, I know this guy who who actually started up this huge investment fund in Singapore, you should talk to them. They're great. I'll do an intro for you. And then it's like, yeah, I don't know that person at that company. I never even heard of that company until now. But literally now they're putting me on an email and just saying, hey, this is Joe. He's great. You should talk to him. Uh, you guys should work together. You should give him a bunch of money. And it's like, great. I didn't have to do anything. I just had to know this guy and be friends with him, who, who I love and genuinely have a meaningful relationship with. And it's like, 
uh, yeah, if you can find those people, you, ha you do have to cold call some people as it were, but um, I think that would be a big piece of advice while you're in school too. If, if there's someone you can reach out to and make connections with, even if they're just, yeah, just direct messaging or emailing or whatever, even that still has value, especially now since we're all uh, latched to our computers. I wanna be respectful of your time, Joe. Still, if you have a question, please raise your hand but we're narrowing it down with our time. COVID has been detrimental to many businesses and individuals, but it's also a time for us to regroup and grow. And a lot of the questions when I ask people if I'm hiring or reviewing certain things, I ask, you know, what did you accomplish or what did you, you how did you grow during during this lockdown period? And I'm, I know a few things about you, Joe. So, I heard you're now into baking. Tell me, how does that, what, how did you get into baking? And then two, how has that helped you in your creative work? Yeah, uh, yeah, we started watching the Great British Bake Off during COVID and I grew up with a family who were terrible cooks, never cooked anything in my life, but I just was inspiring to see everybody make all that stuff. So I thought would try my hand at it. And for me, it's a good just release from working on the computer all the time because I, I love working with my hands, so I always kind of need to be doodling or making something. And for me, it was just a great kind of more organic, uh, a little bit art therapy where I get to sort of craft things and try to challenge myself to to learn something I just know nothing about. Uh, and, but also that it's like at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if I fail at like making uh, homemade bread or whatever. And it's just it's just a nice uh, you know a thing away from my computer screen. I like it, you know, getting your getting textual with your hands. And I think this goes for not just artists, but also for anyone who's interested in different aspects of, of development or building or, or just uh, being in touch with um, uh, different products and materials. In fact, we have a new museum that opened up was all about this uh, similar concept, uh, the, the American Museum of Arts and Crafts movement. And it was this idea that we, through our work with our hands, we do dignified work, but we also become inspired because it's connected to the land, connected how we wanted to live, and, and doesn't far remove or doesn't remove us from uh, from our grounding. We'll say, yeah, jo yeah, and jo it's still creative yes. problem solving in that. So yeah. it's just it's just satisfying to try to make a recipe I've never made before, see it be a disaster, and then try again in a few days and see if I can actually make it decent. And and the proof is really in the pudding, eating the pie and eating whatever bake off your cakes that you're making. So you get to have fun at the end. So wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. So last question. You had a success with Jenny LeClue. What's next for Jenny? What's your next project? And how do we follow, get along, continue to engage? Uh, yeah, so uh, we are working on Jenny LeClue 2, the sequel. We just started that earlier this month. And again, we're developing some other internal titles that we are, um, some other games that we're talking to uh, potential publishers and investors about, as well as possibly Jenny LeClue becoming an animated series. So we're talking to some uh, studios, uh, uh, a big a big company that I can't name, but uh, we're talking to someone right now about possibly making a, a animated series that might be on a, a streaming platform. Um, but so that's exciting because we're doing, uh, I think we've had initial approval from the some executives for that. And so now we'll go into like a development phase where we get to kind of figure out what that'll be. So Jenny is sort of becoming transmedia, which is exciting because I was always envisioned in the game itself, it's like Ginny is a character in a in a book that this author character is writing. So it was already kind of this meta thing. So it's exciting to see where that'll go. So we're we're doing a, a bunch of things, but still trying to keep um, like my goals for our business was to have a sustainable business, not a, uh, a necessarily a growth business. So like for us, it's like how can we do these projects but still be involved in the way we want to and not um, burn our runway money on stuff we don't need. So, you know, Jenny Clue is super successful. I'm still working out of my 
home office, which is like a child's bedroom. So um, just still still staying humble, like living below our means and and just buying time, because I think that's the biggest thing, of course, is I, I'm sure, I don't know if you all talked about it, but obviously of all the things you have, time is the one no one can get more of, um, which is also part of why we're shifting to a four day work week. So always thinking about, you know, would I rather have a slightly bigger business, maybe a little more money or would I rather have more time to do what I love? Um, but not, you know, drive around a, a, a Tesla or whatever. So uh, we're doing all these future projects, but trying to create, keep a sort of sustainably small business versus scaling up, which, you know, if you're making, if you want to make a big uh, corporation, cool, do something that scales up. But I'm, I'm more of a believer in small sustainability. So uh, that is what we're focused on, continuing to do what we love and doing it sustainably. How do we stay in contact? What uh, oh, yeah. channels oh, yeah. or um, what do you recommend? Uh, on Twitter, I'm at MoGraphy underscore Joe. You can follow at Jenny LeClue on Twitter. We're also on Instagram and Facebook. And I don't remember what my handle is. There, but uh, yeah, we're on the internet. So you can search Joe Russ or whatever you can, or Jenny LeClue, you can find us. Joe, it's always a pleasure. I'm grateful that you're in my life. I've learned so much from you and i love our our banter and how we can share and play off and and very different backgrounds but at the same time uh, i think some sort of common interest of humanity common interest of the collective common interest of, of of mankind and womankind and people and society i guess and uh grateful to have you in my life thankful that you are able to spend an hour with us and inspire yeah. us uh, how about this? I would like to follow up in the near future here with how things are going on and maybe discuss more future opportunities. So again, let's give Joe a big round of applause for, for joining us and, and sharing his, his time with us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Y'all have a good day. Thank you, Joe.